sky since I was very young. So in astrology, so still on the sky, but a little bit lower than the stars. But I was just fascinated about storms and the weather. And they used to love watching uh, storm chases or tornado chases on the National Geographic channel. I found it just so fascinating and really, really fun. But uh, later in high school, which I know the education system is a little bit different in America than it is here. So we have primary school, um, which is like, I was, I started in when I was three years old and then I was 11 when I finished primary school up to year six and then high school's from year seven to year 12. So 12 years old to, I think I was 17 when I finished high school, but around uh, year nine or year 10, so about 15, 16 years old, uh, my science teachers took my entire year group on an a documentary about the Hubble Space Telescope. And so I absolutely fell in love with space after watching that documentary. It was just so, so cool. But I, I wasn't necessarily interested in uh, astrophysics at that stage, but I did want to do aerospace engineering and actually send these telescopes into space. And I tell you what, my grandfather really enjoyed that. I'm the youngest on that side of the family and I was the last chance for someone to be an engineer like him. So he, when I told him that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer, he leapt out of his chair and went and got his old engineering book that was being held together with masking tape, which was very, very funny. But uh, when I decided to go to university, I didn't actually like the look of the university program for aerospace engineering because I wouldn't actually get to do any aerospace engineering specific subjects until the fourth year of the degree. And I thought that was complete bull. So instead I decided to go for physics <clears throat> because at least I'd be doing physics from day one. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so I went and did a bachelor of science with a major in physics and then did an honors year, which is kind of like a mini thesis. So one year, I did that last year where I studied huge galaxies and how they merge with other galaxies to grow and get bigger in stellar mass. I'm currently writing a paper based on my research that I did last year, which will hopefully be published sometime early next year. Uh, and now I'm doing a PhD in astrophysics as well, which my current research is, a, I, I say a bit different, but it's actually very different from the research that I did last year. So last year was all about galaxies, but uh, this year starting my PhD, it's all about the Milky Way in a very different way. So what I'm, the field that I'm in at the moment is galactic archeology. span So, which sounds super cool, but it's basically, it's kind of like being Indiana Jones, but in space. So I'm studying certain types of stars in the Milky Way galaxy called red clump stars. Uh, and the reason why we study these particular stars is because red clump stars are kind of like a standard candle. So they're the same brightness, they have the same uh, surface features for all of them. So when you see one red clump star and you see it's X amount of light years away, you know that's gonna be that far away. And then another red clump star will be another X amount of Y light years away. So we can very accurately map the Milky Way galaxy with these types of stars. So the main part of my PhD at the moment is that we're looking for these types of stars and we want to map the Milky Way and see if there's more like carbon on one side of the galaxy or some nitrogen over this side of the galaxy. So we're trying to uh, do, make a hemodynamical map of the Milky Way to try and understand more about the history and formation of the galaxy. I see the docs ask a question, which is a great question. How do they differ from red giants? So red clump stars versus red giant branch stars. Red clump stars, they burn helium in their core, whereas general red giant branch stars, they don't burn helium in their core. So they look very similar, but one burns helium, one doesn't burn helium in the core of the star. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm using this big telescope on the left-hand side. It's called the Anglo-Australian Telescope or the AAT. It's the largest optical telescope in Australia. It's in Coonabarabra, New South Wales, just uh, basically out in the country. It's in a rural area, in a rural town. And uh, I'll be actually using that telescope right over Christmas to observe some more of these red clump and red giant branch stars. So uh, I'll be spending most of my time, not actually at the telescope, but at my university and using this telescope to look at some stars over Christmas, which will be lots and lots of fun. So that's where I'm at at the moment. It just finished, well, just going through my first year of my degree of my PhD. So I've still got another three years to go for that. So I'll have to come back in three years time as Dr. Kirsten Banks. But uh, let's talk about what I wanted to talk about with you guys today. Uh, and that is Aboriginal astronomy. So I wanna start off by introducing you all to Indigenous Australia. 
So what you're seeing on the screen now is a modern map of Australia with the eight states and territories. But when you consider an Indigenous perspective of Australia, it gets a lot more diverse. So this is Australia, but with the Indigenous nations in it. So there are over 250 different groups or nations in the land that we now call Australia, and are even more language groups as well. So each and every one of these nations has an intimate connection to the skies. Uh, my family, we come from Wiradjuri country. It's the large one in central New South Wales down here. It's the largest nation in New South Wales and one of the largest Aboriginal nations in Australia. Now, one thing that we do in Australia is that we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on whenever we hold meetings and events and such. So I'd like to take the time now to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm meeting today, and that is the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders past and present who've taken care of this land for many, many thousands of years and still continue to today. So tonight I'm going to share with you a few stories from my nation, Wiradjuri, as well as from a few other nations around Australia, and how the view and use of the sky is both similar, but also very different to modern astronomy. So you'll see that some similarities with some very big differences as well. So some of these perspectives can overlap as well, which you'll also see throughout tonight, uh, but others are completely different. And that's what makes Aboriginal Australian culture so beautifully diverse. <clears throat> so let's go to the sky. Okay, so to start off tonight, I wanna to show you the different kinds of constellations we have and observe in our perspective of Aboriginal astronomy. And there are three types. So in the first one I wanna to mention to you is very similar to what we see in the Western view and the modern view of astronomy. And that is we have a collection of stars creates a pattern or an object. So one particular very famous constellation in Western astronomy, which I love, and I'm sure you'll all love it as well, because it's currently up at the moment, that is Orion. Great constellation. In fact, the Orion's dagger, the Orion Nebula, is one of the things that really inspired me to go into astronomy. But in West, in um, Aboriginal astronomy, or in Wiradjuri astronomy that we call it, we call it Bayami. So those same stars co connect together to create this uh, image of the great spirit, the great creator spirit, Bayami. So you can see it's very much the same actually. So it's even the same orientation as well. So from your perspective in the Northern hemisphere, you see Orion sitting head first straight up. So be nice, big and strong as the, uh, as the great you know, hunter that he is. But from the Southern hemisphere, we see him upside down or often on his side. I like to say that Orion is, um, has, has had a few drinks in the Southern hemisphere view. So he's a bit upside down, but this actually relates to the story. And you'll notice that Bayami is also the same orientation as Orion too. So, but that is upside down from our perspective in the Southern Hemisphere. But that actually does relate to the story. So the story of from Wiradjuri traditions talks about Bayami. He chases an emu and trips on a log, which causes him to fall head first flat on his face and head first into the ground. And while that may seem quite humiliating for this creative spirit, it's actually represented in the night sky. So since Orion is upside down from our perspective here in the Southern Hemisphere, when the constellation the stars of Orion are setting in the sky, it sets head first, which represents Bayami falling head first into the ground. <laughs> it's actually one of my favorite stories because it's very, very humbling in a way uh, for the creative spirit, but it's also very much representat representative of what's actually happening in the sky. So there you have it. That's the first type of Aboriginal constellation. So a collection of stars to create a pattern or an object in the form of Bayami here. Now the second type is a little bit different. You may recognize these stars. So on the right hand side, we have this very iconic Australian uh, constellation. It's the Southern Cross. It's on our flag. It's also iconic to the Southern Hemisphere in general as well. So that is the Southern Cross right there on the right hand side. But we also have two other important stars, not necessarily constellation, but uh, it is there are two stars here on the left hand side are the southern pointers. And while you would all use the north, the north star Polaris to find north in the northern hemisphere, we can use these stars to find south in the southern hemisphere. So it does uh, change a little bit. I'll see if I can use the, 
the annotate button and I'll draw out a little thing. So when we see these stars up in the night sky in Sydney, and the great thing is that they're always up in the night sky from our perspective here in Sydney and further south as well, because they circumnavigate the south celestial pole. So we can always use them to find south if we're out and about and the GPS is broken, the phone's dead, all things like that. Unless they're unfortunately behind a tree, which does happen a lot in Sydney as well. But, uh, oh, where's my mouse? God, there it is. Okay, so when you use uh, the Southern Cross, you go from the top star up here and draw a line straight down to the bottom star here and continue that line straight out. That's the first step to try and find south. Now that does sometimes point towards south, but the Southern Cross isn't always straight up in the sky. It can be sometimes to the side or to the other side or even upside down. So the second step is to go from the middle of these two stars here and make a big T shape. And where those two lines intersect generally points towards the South Celestial Pole. And then once you find that point, you can then draw a line straight down to the ground and bada bing bada boom, you have South. So a few extra steps involved when uh, finding South in our, uh, in our hemisphere down here, but um, that's how we found South with these constellations. But anyway, Back to uh, astronomy and Aboriginal astronomy, if I can find, there we go. So these particular constellations, both in Wiradjuri astronomy and also in Gamilaroi astronomy, where the Gamilaroi people are just north of Wiradjuri. So we see these stars, the Southern Cross is again a collection of stars that creates some sort of constellation. And it's called Yaran, which is a tree, like a big, big bushy tree, uh, eucalyptus tree in Australia. Uh, and the southern pointers on the left hand side of it, on the other side of it, these are two individual things. So each individual star here actually represents a constellation or represents an object. So in this particular story with the tree Yaran, these two stars here, the southern pointers, are mare mare. Now mare is the word for a cockatoo, which is like this white crested bird with a yellow mohawk. Uh, very, very cute, very cheeky, very loud birds. They are, they are native to Australia. I had one uh, completely obliterate my flowers on my balcony a couple of weeks ago and I was very upset about it. But uh, mare mare are these two southern pointers here. And the reason why we repeat that word twice, mare mare, is because there are multiple of them. So you may have heard of places in Australia like uh, Wagga Wagga. Now Wagga Wagga is in central Australia, central New South Wales rather, so a bit um, right in Wiradjuri country actually. And Wagga is the word for crow, like the bird. So Wagga Wagga means many crows. So it's a town of many, many crows. So when we repeat these words, it means, it means like lots of or more than one. So yes, so here we have Yaran and Mare Mare. And the story of these two types of stars and these two constellations is actually quite beautiful. So it's a story of the first Aboriginal man to die. And I won't go into too many details because it is sacred knowledge. Um, I am indeed screen sharing. Can everyone still see my screen just quickly? Just want to make sure. Yep, okay, fantastic. I'll keep going. So with Yaran and Mare Mare, thank you everyone, by the way, uh, is this story. So this tree, has been uprooted by one of the spirits and pulled up and to be put into the sky. But these two cockatoos, Mare Mare, that tree is their home. And so as the tree is being put up into the sky, Mare Mare and are following their home in the sky. And once again, just like with the story of Bayami, where the motion and the, the movement of the stars represents the story, that same thing happens here. So as the earth rotates and the Southern Cross and Mare Mare and the two pointers move, these two pointers here constantly follow their home in the sky. They constantly follow the Southern Cross. So again, it's a really beautiful story about how the stars actually represent. It's kind of like the, uh, the canvas for our stories. Okay, it's our storybook, the night sky. So, so far we have constellations in Aboriginal astronomy, similar to those in Western culture, whereas we have this collection of stars, but also we have individual stars like with Mare Mare here. Now the third type of constellation, uh, which is my favorite, it's the last one, save it to last, are the dark constellations. So now we're completely ignoring the stars. 
Instead of looking for the stars, we look for these dark patches within the Milky Way galaxy. And this is a fantastic photo. So the telescope that I showed you in the first, one of the first slides, that's actually inside this big dome here. So this is at Coonabarabran, New South Wales. And uh, this is actually one of the darkest, well, not really the darkest, but it, it's a dark sky reserve. So it's a place that's trying to preserve the darkness here. So great skies there, usually when it's not cloudy or when it's not um, terrible seeing. The sky looks fantastic, like you see in this photo here. This is an, an image from uh, winter in Australia. So we have the southern, the Milky Way galaxy stretching right across the sky. And if you look towards the dark parts in the Milky Way, you might be able to see an emu. So we call it in Wiradjuri Gagaman, the, the celestial emu or the dark emu. So have a close look above the dome. You might be able to see to the right hand side, you can probably recognize the Southern Cross just up over here. I hope you can see my mouse as well, by the way. So you can see the Southern Cross over here and this dark patch below the Southern Cross kind of looks like the head of an emu. Like you have a, a beak pointing down and this head here. This is a dark nebula known as the Colsac Nebula in Western astronomy, but it makes up the head of Gagerman over here. Oh, I went too far. Go back. Okay, so it makes up the head of Gagerman here, right? And then if you continue down towards the left, towards the center of the Milky Way, this long patch here, it makes up the neck of the emu. And then the big bulge of the Milky Way galaxy is the body. And there are feet as well, they just continued along <laughs> down the side. So this dark constellation uh, is actually quite common across many of the nations around Australia. So even in Eora, in where I'm staying at the moment, where, I'm, where I live, uh, there is a beautiful rock carving of the emu that when the emu on the rock carving matches what the emu is doing in the sky, that tells them a certain uh, a thing about what the emu are doing at the moment at this current time when that happens. So there you go. We have collections of stars, individual stars, and even no stars with the dark constellations and the dark spots. So those are the three different types of constellations, but not only do the stars play a role, but also the Milky Way galaxy is quite prominent in Aboriginal astronomy because it's pretty easy to see from a dark area with little light pollution, the Milky Way is quite prominent in the night sky and very salient. So it comes as no surprise that the Milky Way plays quite a large role in Aboriginal astronomical traditions. So here are a few different views from a few, from a few different groups, I should say. So the first uh, view I wanna show you is from the Burong people of the Wagaya language group. Uh, they're in Northwestern Victoria. So uh, down, down South, Southeast Australia. So in their traditions, the Milky Way galaxy is called Waring and it represents the smoke from the campfires of the old spirits called the Narambangatia. And the Narambangatia are represented by all of the stars in the sky and are represented on the earth as Puparimbal, which is a small finch. So that's their view of the Milky Way galaxy, the smoke from the campfires of the old spirits. Now up north, so from Gamilaroi people, just above Wiradjuri, so in Northern New South Wales, to them, they see the Milky Way as a waterway or a stream called uh, Warumbul. So on the land, it represents the Macquarie River. And you might be starting to see a bit of a, uh, a theme here. Okay, so the next example I wanna share with you is uh, from my Wiradjuri heritage. And I have said it to last because I'm a little bit biased because I do love it. Okay, in Wiradjuri astronomical traditions, we see the Milky Way as a series of water holes. Now its general name is Billabong, which is actually where the word Billabong derives from. And uh, similarly in Gamilaroi traditions, the Milky Way is specifically named after the nearest river or stream in Wiradjuri land. And there are actually three of them. So if you're near the Lachlan River, which runs through central Wiradjuri country, the Milky Way is called Galare. Okay, where the, the C kind of sounds like a G in our language. Uh, up north, it's called Warumbul for the Macquarie River, just like in Gamilaroi. I guess we do share that one and share a similar name for that river. And down south is called Murrumbidgee for the Murrumbidgee River. So another thing I'd like to mention before we continue on is that you may have noticed a parallel between what is seen in the sky and what is seen also on the land. So a very important concept in Aboriginal culture is what is in the sky is matched and mirrored on the land, kind of like a, a, a mirage. 
So we're all interconnected. So the sky, the land, the people all work together as a, uh, as a unified thing. So that's how we can, uh, that, those are the different views of the night sky. But now how do we actually use the stars? Other than using it as a storybook, what are some of these uses? So remember Gogoman from earlier, the dark emu? Well, while Gogoman is pretty to look at, it has quite a significant use in Wiradjuri culture and other nations around uh, Australia. Also navigation, yes, Jack. Right, so its position in the night sky for the emu at certain times of the year indicates to us when is the right time to go looking for emu eggs. So when the emu is rising just above the horizon, just like in this photo here, after the sun has set, this is usually in late May or early June, Gogoman looks like it's running along the horizon. So this indicates that the female emu are currently running around looking for a mate. And uh, just to remind you, this is where Wiradjuri is, just to give you context of where we're thinking. Okay, so in central New South Wales. Okay, but uh, later, later in the year, after the Earth has traveled a little bit further around the sun, the body of the emu travels higher up into the sky and you see this particular view. And when the body sits, the emu, when the body of the emu sits directly overhead after the sun has set, we now see it as not an emu's body anymore in a Wiradjuri, but instead as an emu egg in a nest. And that indicates that now is the right time to go looking for emu eggs to eat. So yes, it's basically harvesting. It's like a seasonal menu. And I thought I'd share with you guys uh, today. I don't often do this online because it's. It, I don't know if the sound works very well, but. I want to share with you how you actually go and look for emu eggs. I think it'll be really interesting to like share that with you guys. So in Wiradjuri culture and in many Aboriginal cultures is uh, when we go out to go, we know the stars have told us, the stars have indicated to us, now's the right time to go looking for emu eggs. How do we go do that? So we'd go out into the bush looking for an emu sitting on a nest. Now, usually it's actually the male emu that sits on the nest to incubate the eggs. And uh, emu are very, very territorial animals. So as soon as they hear that an emu might be in their territory, they're gonna go look for it and try and get rid of it. So what you do is you go ahead and go grab one of these things. I don't know if you can see uh, my camera at the moment, but what I'm holding in front of me at the moment is an emu caller. And it's painted by a Wiradjuri artist as well. So you may have heard of a didgeridoo before. It's basically like a mini didgeridoo, or it looks like a mini didgeridoo. Uh, you don't play it like a didgeridoo though. So you don't blow into it or anything, you actually hit it. So to make the sound of an emu, and there is a particular emu that you need to make the sound of. So since the males sit on the nest, you actually want to make the sound of another male. So and that sounds like this. That's the sound of an emu. I know, I was shocked the first time I heard it too, but it's this like deep throaty, um, like sound. So you go ahead and with a friend, you'd make this sound, make the sound of the male emu. A female emu sounds like this, just with continuous hits, but the males do that double hit. So when the male sitting on the nest hears that sound, he's gonna go get up and try and look for the imposter and get rid of the imposter. So while the emu has stood up and has gone along and is chasing your friend, you can then safely go to the nest and take an emu egg. Now we don't want to take all of them because we're all about sustainability in Aboriginal culture. So you take just one, maybe two, so that there are more emu eggs to continue to grow into emu and then have more emu eggs for next season. So to continue that cycle, not taking too much from the land and always giving back. So yes, so once the stars have told you that this is the now, now the time to go, that's what you do. And that's how you get an emu egg. Now, another example, this one comes from the Burong people, so in Wagaya, so that's actually where they, where they are. So Victoria is kind of this sort of area just below here. And so Wagaya is just in Northwestern Victoria there. So to give you context of where we're looking. So the Burong people of the Wagaya language group, uh, they view the Milky Way as a smoke from the campfires of the old spirits from before. They call the star Arcturus Mapian Kuruk which is an ancestral figure that indicates, again, when a certain food is available to eat. So when Mapian Kuruk, or Arcturus, is in the northern evening sky, the bitter is coming into season, where the bitter is a pauper of the wood ant, which is supposedly a sweet treat to eat. 
although I have never tried it. <laughs> but uh, this is usually around early August to September. But once Marfian Kodak sets with the sun, called Naui, this is early in November, the bitter are no longer in season. So there you have two examples of using the movement of the stars to indicate when is the right time to find certain foods. And this has worked for over 65,000 years. It's a very long withstanding culture and long withstanding knowledge and very rich knowledge of the night sky. Uh, but sticking with Burong, uh, even exploding stars, or technically in this case, almost exploding stars feature in the astronomical traditions of Aboriginal people. So the Burong people of the Wagai language group, they speak of a star called Kologuluak Wa, who was the wife of Wa, uh, which is the second brightest star in the night sky. And in the late 1840s, there's a British colonist, uh, colonist rather, called William Edward Stanbridge. He sat and learned attentively from the Borong people and writing down the names of these Borong stars and their equivalent Western names using a star atlas. And uh, when the Borong people pointed out Kologuluak Wa, Stanbridge couldn't actually identify the star. So he just noted it down as a large red star in this area and all the small stars around her are her children. Now the actual star behind Kologuluakwa remained a mystery for almost 150 years until in 2011, it was identified as one of the most massive stars known called Eta Carina. So you may have, this is a beautiful object to view through telescopes. I love it. It's just so incredible seeing the homunculus nebula, which is the one on the screen right now. And uh, I, don't, I don't need to tell you guys, but you know, this star is so, so cool. It's part of a binary star system. So it's not one, but two stars orbiting around each other in space. It's more than 4 million times as bright as the sun, but it's 7,500 light years away from the Earth. And this uh, bigger star of the binary pair is very unstable and occasionally goes through violent outbursts where it spews out stellar material from its outer shells and becomes very, very bright. And uh, Eta Carina did this in the 1840s and expelled a mass equivalent to 20 suns. So this made it go from being a background star that you couldn't really see in the night sky with your eyes to being the second brightest star behind Sirius, which is pretty serious to say the least. I know I have really bad space jokes, but anyway, it then faded again a few years later to be another background star again. And so the Borong people saw this and noted it down and the change in brightness, even the color, of this supernova imposter and included it in their astronomical traditions. That is observational astronomy in a nutshell without a telescope. How incredible is that? So even almost exploding stars are also included in the astronomical traditions of Aboriginal peoples. But we've talked a lot about the stars and the Milky Way galaxy at the moment. So planets also play quite a significant role in Aboriginal astronomical traditions. So Aboriginal people knew that the planets were different from the stars and they studied the sky intimately and noted down the relative changing positions and the brightness of each of the visible planets, all the ones that you can see here. So continuing on, planets, not, a, not only stars, but planets can also be used for navigation. So for example, you have the ecliptic here, which is the orange line on the picture, which is the apparent path of the sun in the sky throughout the year. And uh, what you'll notice is that the planets and the moon all appear either very close or even on the ecliptic, which is an effect from how our solar system was created such that the majority of planets in the solar system orbit on a very similar plane around the sun. And this is why we see them along this ecliptic line. And this ecliptic uh, was used by Aboriginal people for navigation. And it's quite obvious in the sky, especially when there are plenty of planets up at the same time, like in this view here. But another view, and this is viewed by the Waterman people up in the Northern Territory. So this is the very top tip of Queensland on the right-hand side and the top of New, uh, Northern Territory up here. So this is the Waterman people just there. So they were able to use the planets as navigation, but another part from uh, Waterman culture about the planets, which I find really inspiring and really, really cool is that they also talked about the planets being uh, ancestral figures that walked the path, the ecliptic, both forwards and backwards. So they were noting down the retrograde motion of the planets many thousands of years before any other modern scientist had noted it down, which I think is just incredible. Just the detail that there is within Aboriginal astronomy is incredible. 
Now, with the next part, this is a bit of a mix between astronomy and meteorology. So this 22 degree moon halo you can see here in this picture holds quite a significant use in Aboriginal astronomical traditions. So in many nations, if you count the number of stars that you can see inside of the halo, that will tell you how many days there will be until rain comes. Weather, <laughs> predicting the weather with the stars or the moon in this case. So not only can the stars, planets, and now the moon be used for food, finding food and navigation, but they can also be used for predicting the changes in the weather. Okay, this is pretty cool too. And it always works. It's really incredible. Now, the last thing I wanted to mention uh, to you all is a couple of uh, Aboriginal stars that have actually gained global recognition. So the International Astronomical Union uh, collectively come together to give official names to all the stars in the sky. And recently, a couple of years ago, and recently now as well, they've given a couple of names from very various different groups and Indigenous groups around the world. And Australia has gotten a couple as well. So I want to share with you what we have currently. I think there's two more that's come out recently as well, but here's the four that I know of. So in the Burung people, the Burung people observe this star, which is a used, well, it is, its designation is Sigma Canis Majoris, but its official name is now Energonite, coming from the Burung people. So Energonite is an ancestral figure with two wives. So Energonite is this little star here, but the two bright stars either side of Energonite are representative of his two wives. And the moon in this story is called Mityan, which is represented by a qual, where a qual is kind of like, uh, kind of like a possum, not, not like the possums you have in America, but like the possums we have here in Australia, but they're kind of tan in color and they have white spots on it, which the spots map to the spots on the moon. So that's why we had the representation of the qual with the Burong people. But anyway, the moon Mityan fell in love with one of the wives of Energonite and tried to lure her away. But until Energonite discovered Mityan's trickery and attacked him, leading to a great fight in which Mityan was defeated. And the moon, Mityan has been wandering the heavens ever since with the scars of battle still visible on his face. Now, and again, you've seen throughout tonight that our stories or the, the night sky reflects the stories and vice versa. So in this story where Mityan is trying to lure away one of the wives, the moon actually goes through what's called an occultation with only one of the wife stars. So the moon passes in front of one of the wife stars, which is the act of trying to lure her away. Also, when you have the fight between Energonite and Mityan, that's when the moon passes in front of Energonite the star. So again, the night sky is really integral to our stories and to what we, what we do. So that's one, one out of four. The next one comes from the Waterman people up in the Northern Territory. So Zeta Phoenix uh, is now officially known as Warren, which means child in Waterman language. So in this context, it refers to a little fish uh, where Warren gives water to Gawalian, which is the echidna or the star Akana, in which they direct initiates for a particular ceremony to carry water in small bowls. And this water comes from a great waterfall used to call this, these people during this particular ceremony. And uh, when this star, Warren, is high up in the northern sky, this actually represents that the monsoon season is about to begin. So another seasonal, seasonal star here with Warren. This next one, another one from Waterman people up in the Northern Territory, is you have Larawag, which is designated as Epsilon Scorpi. So, all of the stars in the body of the scorpion actually play a significant role in another ceremony for the Waterman people, where each star represents a different stage of the ceremony. And Larawag is known as the signal watcher, and he gives the all clear signal, allowing the secret part of a ceremony to continue. So it's officially known as Larawag. And this last one is my favorite because it's on our flag and it's awesome. So another one from the Waterman people is you have Epsilon Crucis, the little fifth star of the Southern Cross, the small one, is now officially known as Ginan, which uh, Ginan represents a small red bag, which um, holds songs of knowledge that's passed on from each generation. So I think that's the fact that that's on our flag and it's now represented worldwide by an Aboriginal name is just fantastic. So um, yeah, 
I hope you guys really enjoyed this. That's all I have uh, in terms of content for you today, but I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about uh, my, my culture and, and the, the night sky from the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them now. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. That was absolutely spectacular. Uh, I mean, we, I know I learned a lot. Uh, um, one of the things as a planetarium, when we do our shows, we, uh, one of my interests is archaeoastronomy. And uh, this ties in beautifully. And uh, our previous planetarium director uh, has a whole show where he's now uh, teaching in one of the universities. And uh, I'm, I think he may have been on and hopefully he'll use this part of the teaching. But um, if uh, anybody has questions, I will uh, why did you unmute yourselves and ask questions? Maybe Santa Claus has a question. Yes, skip, skip. but it has nothing to do with astronomy unless the tattoo on your arm has to do with astronomy. Uh, <laughs> Aha, good <picture. laughs> So, in a, in a, when I was younger uh, in high school, I played saxophone for 13 years. So it's a, a musical tattoo. But I do have, I do actually have an astronomy related tattoo as well. It's a down on my ribs, it says per astra constructum built by the stars. Oh, cool. So definitely cool. die hard nerd <laughs> for all the things that I love. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, it was a very interesting uh, 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 history of the Aboriginal uh, myths. And uh, I was interested to learn that uh, all these things were observed so long ago you said 65,000 years ago mm -hmm. and then I, you know that's you know we think oh, the, the uh, Arabs or the Greeks were ancient but th this is really ancient uh, and how did they uh, know these myths were, did they have writing or did, was it orally or yeah so a lot of our culture is done through oral um passing down of knowledge. So there weren't any books or anything, but we have uh, carvings. So rock carvings, cave carvings. Uh, we'd demonstrate and pass on knowledge through many different ways, either through spoken word, through song and dance. It's, it's a very different um, way of, of thinking and way of uh, imparting knowledge. Like the pedagogy of Aboriginal culture is widely different and vastly different from what we consider good education today. Mm -hmm. Sure. And one other clarification, uh, you, your research is on, is it carbon stars or I couldn't? Un, uh, uh, red clump stars. I'll put it clump. into the chat. Oh, C-L-U-M-P? So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Red clump stars. Oh, okay. It's as, like I heard it. Thank you. Kirsten, yeah, you said the te telescope is located where now? In Coonabarabran. Okay. okay. Yeah. Kirsten, I was wondering if, if you had heard of a thing called the Murakami's object. They're yellow supergiants that have grown from white dwarfs to enormous uh, yellow supergiants, like 20,000 times the size of our sun. And they've done it within a human lifetime, which has sort of blown evolutionary astronomy completely out of the water. Yeah. I don't know if you've, yeah have you heard of I've... those objects? Not heard of that before. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, you should look it up. Um, yeah, they're 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 the new class of yellow supergiant. Uh, Murakami's object is the, the name. Americani. Okay. M U R A K A M I. Murakami. Yeah. It might tie in. All with right, I have that. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. I look forward to reading about that. That sounds really interesting. And mm -hmm. like you said, just completely changes the whole. Yes, the whole idea whole that it paradigm. takes billions of years for stars to grow. Yeah, d stars that were thought to be on life support are now just growing massively within a very, very, very short time frames. So it kind of blows up the whole uh, Harvard model. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's because they got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> they, added, they added weight due to the COVID pandemic, so they've isolated from all their friends. Uh, so it's, <laughs> some of the most, it's the latest research. It's done probably in the last 10 years that papers have come out on it, so... They're cool. Pretty, I'll definitely give them a read. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry, Chris. Going back to the telescope, what is the size of the mirror? Uh, the mirror is 3.9 meters. Okay. Oh, big. big yeah. Meter. Oh, 
Yeah. So about 40 feet. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I can convert things. <laughs> 14 feet, yeah. Um, anybody else? I did see a question um, sent to me privately sure. asking about any books on the subject. So there are a couple of books around. Um, there's a book called uh, Emu Dreaming. It's by Ray Norris. I might have a copy of it here. No, I don't have it on my desk. Um, but yeah, it's Emu Dreaming by Ray Norris. It gives a pretty good introduction to Aboriginal astronomy in um, very specifically, which is good. Uh, but I'd also recommend an, a, a book called Dark Emu by Bruce Pascoe. Uh, I know you're thinking it sounds like it's more about the emu constellation, but it's actually a much more broad view of Aboriginal culture in general. And uh, it's, it's actually written by an Aboriginal person, Bruce Pascoe. So it's really, really good. So I just wanted to comment and said, this is wonderful. I learned so much. And um, I don't know if they told you, but our Civil Air Patrol Squadron for Mount Airy is here and joined your meeting because we're doing astronomy this quarter for our aerospace education. So this has been a real treat. And uh, I'm Cherokee, Chichalegia and Ueña. So we also have our indigenous uh, astronomy and stuff too. So it was really nice to see a whole nother perspective from the other side of the, uh, the world really. And um, oh, that's we so beautiful. I don't, see very much from the southern hemisphere so that's awesome because we tend to focus on the north right because that's where we live um but one thing i was really interested in too was the uh, polynesians and their wayfaring and using the stars and that taught me a little bit about the southern hemisphere so i learned so much from you and i really appreciated it so i wanted to let you know oh thank you laura and and from my language to yours mandenguo which is uh, where i drew for thank you ah wado <laughs> jerk Doc, I think I can see you talking, but I don't think we can hear right. you. Well, I'm sorry. I, I said, I hope we can have you back again next year. Uh, I think we all yeah, learned a lot. And uh, maybe, uh, certainly we'll put 2028 on our, on our calendar. <laughs> Expect a bunch of astronomy people from Westminster, Maryland to <laughs> on your doorstep. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll take you up to the observatory. It'll be great fun. <laughs> And another Muldane question. What time is it there? Uh, it is quarter past 12 in the afternoon. On about lunch time. Thursday? Thursday? On Thursday, yes. So hey, I we the know future. the world doesn't blow up in the next 12 hours, so we're okay. Cool. <laughs> we're already in tomorrow. We're safe. We're good. We're good. All right. Well, uh, again, thank you again. We, we really, I really appreciate it. Again, I want to sort of shout out to my wife who sort of found you while she was looking up various aspect, things to do during the pandemic. And that's how I got uh, in contact with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to keeping in touch. And I'm sure the other astronomy folks in our club, if they want to reach out to you, I hope you oh, don't yeah. mind. I hope you don't mind if they have questions or. Yeah, please do. I love answering questions, uh, especially on social media. So you can find me on all of the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok as well, um, at Astro Kirsten is where you can find me. Okay. <laughs> just followed you on Twitter, so. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, listen, have a great afternoon, great day, and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas Happy to New all of Year. you as well. Happy New Year. Yes. yes, and thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. It really was wonderful, really. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was great. My absolute pleasure, everyone, and stay safe. I know things aren't as great uh, in the U.S. as it is here in Sydney, so I hope you're all staying safe and all good, all good things for the holiday period for all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Yep. Merry Christmas.